Good morning. Good morning. Your Bible is open to Colossians. Don't you love technology today? No. No. When it works. Well, I have um, almost, you can get almost all of Ella White's writings on your phone. So at lunchtime, I read, I'm reading now the Acts of the Apostles. I already read the Great Controversy. Um, and in the chapter I just read, she quotes from this section of Colossians. In this part that I'm reading, Paul is in jail at Rome. And uh, you would think that his influence would be minimized by being in jail in Rome. But you come to find out that she tells you that Paul's influence now is greater than it ever was when he was free. That because he's in the jail at Rome, now he has all the time that he needs to really focus on the building up of the church members and all the different churches that he started. Not only that, but Paul, while he's in Rome, is such a witness. Now I want you to think about this. Was Rome at the time of Paul's um, imprisonment, was it a good place for Christians to be? No. Was the government, did they protect Christians and their rights? No. Did Paul have religious liberty? No. Okay. Were there any lawyers there just knocking on the door no. waiting to plead Paul's case? No. no. Okay, so Paul, with his witness, was able to convert so many people that even people in Caesar's household had become Christians. Now, I want you to think about that. Think about that. You know who the Caesar was at the time? Nero. Nero. Wasn't he a great fellow? Okay. And yet Paul was able to witness and have converts to the faith, even into Nero's household. Now, what kind of life did that man live? Now listen, brothers and sisters, you read these verses, and these verses tell you how Paul accomplished that. That Paul had all of this knowledge and all of this understanding, to the point where Felix told him, Paul, all this learning has made you what? Mad. Mad. Crazy. You're out of your mind. And Paul goes, I wish you were as out of my mind as you think I am. For Christ's sake. Okay? What Paul lived was this love that he told the people in Colossae to put on. Above all these things, put on love. Do you realize that the soldiers that were chained to him and got to be with him all day and all night understood this love? Now, you never read of these soldiers treating him badly, do you? Do you know why? Because they loved him. They understood the kind of character he had. And they never saw that in anyone else except these Christians. Okay? So turn with me again to Colossians. Let's look at our text. Let's look at verse 12. Therefore... What does Paul call you? Do you guys understand that? You are the elect of God. Listen, when the world looks at Christians, they should definitely see a difference. They should see the very elect of God. How should we act if we are the elect of God? Therefore, as the elect of God, and what are you? Holy. You're holy and you're beloved. Okay? Therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, put on what? Tender mercies. tender mercies. Do you realize it's the tender mercies that actually makes you holy? It's not what you do or what you don't do on a specific day. It's not what day you choose to worship or not worship. It's not that you tithe or don't tithe that makes you holy. What makes you holy is that the Holy Spirit lives 
inside of you. And wherever God dwells, that ground is what? When Moses approached the burning bush and it spoke to him, now tell me, if a bush spoke to you, would you get closer to it? Sometimes I just, I just wonder if these, I would run away. But listen, there was something about that presence that drew him closer. Because do you think a bush spoke to him on a daily basis? And think about that, okay? But when he saw this, what did he say? Let me draw closer. Because the Spirit of God and the presence of God was there, right? And God is what? And because God is love, Moses felt that love, and it drew him to the bush. So he gets to a certain point and the bush speaks to him. And what does the bush say? Why? Because you're on holy ground. So do you understand this? If the Holy Spirit lives in you, then you are holy ground. Right? And that's what allows you to be tender and loving and kind in a world that's hard and rude and just ridiculous at some times. Now, Ray, is it hard for you to be soft? Uh, no, I, I don't know. Maybe sometimes. Depends on the situation, right? Yeah. Because I've seen you. I've seen you cry. You could cry easily. So you have a soft spirit. When they say, when they say, the whole throw you through that song, I saw God holding my hand. But I also know you can be a hard man, too. Oh, yeah. Me, too. What keeps you soft all the time? Ricky, what about you? What's your, what's your temperament and personality? It's all over the place. <laughs> That's why I like you. See, because, because you're human. Right? What keeps us grounded and what keeps us focused and what allows us to be long-suffering when people really, really, just really irritate you? The only thing that would do that is something outside of you coming and living inside of you. Amen. That gives you that kind of power because you cannot do it yourself. Is that right? right? So listen, if you're the elect of God, is it God's will for you to suffer with all these fallen human emotions and passions? Or is it God's will for you to have victory to overcome them? Victory. Well, that was kind of weak. Victory. victory. Do you believe it or you don't believe it? Now listen, you tell me today you believe it, but when you leave here and you go out and you do your job and you go about your life, does your life show that you believe it? Now listen, if you were to ask my wife, she would tell you, yes, he believes it. And if you were to ask my employees, they might tell you something different depending on how they act. You know what I'm saying? So Ricky, sometimes I'm all over the place. Ray, I can cry one minute, and the next minute I can be cold as ice. We talked about this in our Sabbath school class. I don't want to. I don't want to be all over the place. I don't want my walk with Christ to be like this, 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 this. Amen. I want it to be like this. Amen. And I want my walk with my brothers and sisters to be like this. Is that right? It's a consistent. But, relationship that we strive for. But I can only have this with you guys if I have this with my God and my Savior. Amen. Is that right? Yes. Amen. Let's look at what Paul counsels us to do here in Colossians. Verse 12, Therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, put on tender mercies, kindness. What's that next one? Humility. And what's the next one after that? What's the difference between humility and meekness? I thought they were the same thing itself. So. Okay, Gary? King James says humbleness. They're easier to understand the differences. Read both of this. So it says humbleness for what? Humility or meekness? Humbleness of mind, meekness, long suffering. Okay. So see, I'm reading from the New King James. You're, you're not puffed up and you're tender. That's what it can you have meekness without humility? No. Can you have humility without meekness? 
So they do go together, right, Deborah? I thought that that word meekness came uh, root from being like domesticated. That that like a lot of uh, a really big animal like an elephant, he has been dom domesticated, and so when we bring our own strength down, we can be meek. I like that. Now you think about this. How many of you guys ever dealt with cows before? Now, how much does a cow weigh sometimes? I mean, they're like fifteen hundred pounds, right? And some of them could be almost a ton. Now, can you imagine walking beside our herd of them? Where you're like, let's say you're a big man and you're 300 pounds. What's 300 pounds compared to 1,800 pounds? But yet, man, a cow will follow you around and lick you. And if you got food for them, they've been domesticated, right? Now, how about goats? Anybody raise goats here? Now, goats are some of the meanest things that you ever meet. If you got food, they'll love you to death. And if that food runs out, then they butt you. And they can be quite mean, even though they're domesticated. See, you and I are like goats. If we're around people that we like, we can be domesticated. We can be meek, we can be trained, we can be very nice. But you know, if you upset us, then we can turn into goats. And we'll work. Right? But what, what Christ has come to do is He has come to give us a new nature. Is that right? Yeah. So that we do not have to be slaves to the passions of this fallen flesh. Amen. That because of Christ, I can actually use my mind and think before I speak. Right? Think before I act. And allow His calming influence to keep me calm. Is that right? This is what Paul found the secret of. Paul said, I've learned how to be content in all situations, right? Uh, and, and listen, Paul was in a lot of different situations. So going back to our text, it says, verse 13, Bearing with one another and forgiving one another, if anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, what are you to do? Now here's the question, I want you to think about this. When Paul has given us this counsel, who is he telling us to be like this with? The world or the brethren? Well, I heard the world, I heard the brethren. Now there is a difference here, and I want you to understand this. Who is he giving this advice to? That if you have something against a brother, then you should forgive him as Christ forgiven you. Treat them with humility, treat them with love, and treat them with compassion. Is he talking about the world, or is he talking about the brethren? You guys understand this. This is why Jesus said, you will know them, that they are mine, because of what? The love they have for each other. So listen, brothers and sisters, I tell you this to let you know that your church family, those who also take the name of Jesus Christ, you have been called to show them this kind of love. Now, there are people in this world and people even in the church that are very hard to get along with. Is that right? Some people, you're called to love them, but you're not called to be with them all the time. Right? There are some people that you may rub each other the wrong way. People that you're in church with. People maybe even in your own family. And, and, and distance can be a good thing. You understand what I'm saying? Let me ask you a question. Who was Paul's first missionary uh, uh, co-traveler? And didn't they have a fallen out? Yes. And did they ever work together after that? Oh, yeah. Now let me ask you that question again. Did they ever work together after that? No. Yes. When? Way late. When? In the very end, he said the only one that was with him was, was Barnabas. Mm. Is that what it said? 
The only one who was part of this. I bring you to this so, number one, you look and study for yourself. Number two, that you realize that Paul and Barnabas had fallen out over John Mark. And it was John Mark that Paul was able to say, this is my son in faith. Bring him because he helps me. Okay? But now, you read the Spirit of Prophecy, you find out that Paul and Barnabas were able to work things out. Now, Paul took Silas as his co-laborer. Barnabas took another man as his co-laborer, but they all worked together. Right? They may have went to different fields, but they were still brothers in the faith. Is that right? Yeah, they worked together separately. <laughs> <laughs> so listen, that's, that's a biblical example that God understands that we are human and that we are just dust. And there are certain people that do not get along with other people. They do not work well together. That doesn't mean that in Christ you have to be separated in heart. You see what I'm saying? Now let me ask you this question. If you got four people and they were all A type personalities, they all ran big businesses and they were all very successful, and you put them all to work together, all four of them, how well would that work? Not good. Do you know why? Because you can't have all chiefs without Indians. Isn't that right? So listen. Within the confines and the construct of the church and how it works. This is why meekness and humility is so important. Because it doesn't matter how successful or how powerful I am or how strong my personality may be. When we come together, when we do the Lord's work, when we sit on a church board, when we sit in church positions, we are called to serve, not to be served to serve, and we are called to look at the other as better than ourselves. Amen. But with that, we're also called to the reality of some people just don't work well with others. Right? But within the church, the church is big enough and has enough position to actually put them in a place where they can be, uh, they can grow, God can use them, and that they can be a blessing to others. <coughs> Jim, you had your hand up? Yeah. Uh, Dr. White, in one of his lectures, or actually it was, it was in an interview, mm -hmm. uh, if anybody's familiar with him, and Francis Duplice is his buddy, he's a, he's a pastor, archaeologist, and he made a statement that uh, Francis Duplice said to him that, that uh, Walter White knocks him down and he picks him up. <laughs> <laughs> I thought that was very... You know, like that statement. Different personalities. Yes. So listen. This is the worst thing that could happen in a church. And that is that the church leadership expects everybody to be just like them. And that the church as a whole wants everybody to come in and then become just like them. God made you to be an individual with a distinct personality that nobody else has. And God has called you to be that person. To represent Christ in who you are. Because you're going to be able to touch people that I can't touch. I'm going to be able to reach people that you can't reach. And that's what God has called us for. So that when we come together and we're one body. Some of us are hands. Some of us are feet. Some of us are mouths. Some of us are brains. But together, we make Christ. Yes. So that when they see us, they don't see us, but they see Him. Yes. Isn't that what we're here for? Yes. Now, brothers and sisters, what I want to talk to you about this morning is, we've asked this question, we ask it over and over and over again, do you believe you're living in the last days, the end of time? And everybody says the same thing, yes. How do we get from the church where we're at, and we're called the Church of Laodicea, the church that is uh, lukewarm. But Laodicea also has two meanings. Did you know that? Laodicea is also the church that overcomes. Did you know that? Amen. Because if Laodicea wasn't the church that overcomes, then there would be another church after that. And is there a church after that? So these lukewarm Christians are the same ones that will overcome. 
because at some point they wake up. Right? They wake up and they see their true condition. And they don't look at each other and say, it's your fault. And you don't look at me and say, it's my fault. You realize it's our fault. But you know what happens? We take the Word of God and we actually start to do what it says. We buy from Him, I self, so that we can see what our true condition is. Amen. We buy from Him that robe that makes us righteous. Is there anything you can do in and of yourself that makes you righteous? No. no, no. Is the gospel free? Yes. You ever wonder why that, that part of Revelation says, buy from me? <laughs> buy from me gold. Wow, gold's really expensive. How can I buy it? I'm wretched, poor, blind, and naked. It means you must acquire the joy of the gospel. It's in the translation. It means you must acquire something that, that isn't yours. So listen, when I look at that and say, okay, you got to buy it, I'm thinking, okay, well, how do I get enough money to buy it? And then I realize I will never have enough money to buy it. But Christ says to come to Him freely. Yes. If you're thirsty, come to Him. Drink freely. If you're hungry, come to Him and eat freely. Yes. And you can come to Him and what you need, He will give you. The problem is, is we don't want to take it. Because we still want to have some type of control. Do you know what the difference of the first century church and our church is today? Is that they understood that Christ is all, in all, with all. And there's nothing outside of Him that you need. We say, we love Jesus. I hope He comes soon. But we're thinking, man, I got this thing. I hope He doesn't come tonight because I really got to do this tomorrow. Or, 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 I haven't gotten married yet, and I really want to have married, or I'm expecting a child, I really want to have this child, okay? The difference is, we speak and don't believe. They believed and they spoke. And the world heard them, and they converted the world, even into Caesar's household. But there's good news, brothers and sisters. The church of Laodicea, the church that is sleeping, they're going to wake up, and they're going to see, and they're going to cling to Jesus Christ. Amen. But you know what? It's not going to be easy. Now, how many of you guys have ever been in a dead sleep and have like your dog or cat jump on your chest <laughs> to wake you? How many of you have had your kids come and jump on your chest to wake you? Was that a pleasant way to wake up? No. The church is asleep. And God is going to shake the church and wake up the saints. And it's going to be a violent shaking. And it's not going to be a pleasant waking up. But it's something that has to be done. Because that's what we need. And God loves you enough to give you what you need. Right? What you need. And God is going to come and He's going to wake up His saints. And we are going to rise and see His face and finally realize our true condition. And we're going to buy from Him gold, tried in the fire. We're going to get the eye cell. We're going to take His robe of righteousness and we're going to finally take off our filthy rags and put on His righteousness. The righteousness of Jesus Christ. Amen. Brothers and sisters, this morning I have a special friend here. Her and her husband. I've known them since I've been an Adventist. Ramona and Jean Brunix. They made it to the church. They didn't know if that was going to happen or not. But Jean says, I know how to get there. And they got here. Ramona is going to play a special song for us. Um, that's one of the things of my first memories of meeting Ramona and her husband, is that Ramona is very talented. Uh, she teaches music. She has sung, played, and she's going to grace us today with the gifts that God has given her. Ramona? She taught my daughter piano. Did she teach your daughter piano? Yeah. Jen and I, this is what I, yeah, I'll turn it off. 
John and I go back a long way, I think of him like a son, and I had put in a call to him and said, I've got this coming Sabbath. I told the my church where I attend at the uh, Deltona Church that I when we get a fifth Sabbath, I'm going to take it off because I'm so busy playing and singing, I'd like a Sabbath off. And I said, I'm going to be in New Salerno. <laughs> they said, no, you're not. You've got to lead in the praise team. You're supposed to lead in the praise team every fifth Sabbath. I said, I'm sorry. but. God is good, and I did find some people that are going to do every fifth Sabbath, so I have the fifth Sabbath on. And uh, so glad to be here, finally. <laughs> and uh, I was interested in, in one of the testimonies today gave a verse that is one of my favorite verses. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths, Proverbs 36. And so therefore I'm going to sing for you at this time, I ask the Lord. Amen. service out. 